Stefan from the University of Barcelona, who will tell us about black tsunamis and mega similarities in ADSFP. Um, yeah, for that, of this. So, you don't mean I can remove my mask. Is everyone fine with me removing my mask? I know we cannot talk to you very well, but uh, by. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, so well, thanks, thanks a lot for uh, having me here, for inviting me here, and I think it's becoming kind of a cliche that everyone says that uh, what we're happy to see each other in person. It's not a cliche. I really feel uh, very happy and honored uh, to be here and what well, being able to spend these days in physics and uh, what we start in contacts. So, well, what I'm going to talk about uh, today is, uh, title is this one, it's work. Okay, so what's happening now? Mm. Uh, this is my problem at my end. To restart the so you don't have it now, but now but show it again. It's multiple connections. You're seeing my screen, right? Yes. It's not responding to that. Ah. Well, I'll do it like this. Okay, so this talk is based on the work that we did uh, last year. I know there people who were at uh, that point in Barcelona, David Lee, Yotaku Suzuki, Maria, who's now over here, and Benson Way. And uh, well, I want to tell you something, story about the uh, horizons and similarities. And horizons and similarities are things that are very important in gravitational theory, but they seem to be very different objects. <coughs> <coughs> Thank you. So, uh, in a way that uh, we're still trying to understand better, they seem to be associated to the emergence of uh, geometry. Similarities, on the other hand, they are rough places, and uh, these are the places where uh, geometry breaks down. So it looks like uh, these two concepts are, are very different, and they are also different in a number of other respects. Horizons are limits to, to what we can observe. Whereas singularities, what they tell us is the, the limits of uh, what we can predict. At least uh, whenever I talk about uh, predictivity here, it will always be predictivity using the classical theory of geometry. So there are different concepts, but nevertheless, they are linked by the cosmic censorship uh, conjecture or conjectures that uh, Penrose formulated, which essentially what they say is that uh, you can predict everything that you can observe. Or if you turn this uh, sentence around, that you cannot observe what uh, you couldn't predict. There's, I put the conjectures, because there's uh, two different conjectures that relate to horizons and similarities. The one that's going to be relevant for today's talk is the weak cosmic censorship conjecture, which what it says is that uh, you can predict everything that you can observe from afar, from, from a distance. Of course, this is a statement that's not uh, mathematically neat. Maybe you want to formulate it uh, in a way that uh, it's more technical. We can say that the evolution of uh, initially smooth uh, configurations, which start with smooth initial data, and then uh, you let them evolve according to the equations of Einstein, and then this evolution should remain predictable for asymptotic observers. And if you were, and you want to wear your, uh, don your mathematician's hat, then uh, you say that the maximal Cauchy development of initial data uh, possesses a complete uh, scrape class. But all these uh, statements are at the end of the 
they say the same thing, which is that uh, naked singularities can't be formed, starting from initially reasonable configurations. And uh, well, this is something that I think it's uh, very and important about uh, nature. Because if a naked singularity is good form, then we could observe quantum gravity. We could learn about quantum gravity or about uh, beyond the highest energy regime of physics and or the shortest uh, length scales in nature. We could uh, learn about them from a distance without having to jump in, inside a black hole. So naked singularities would be an opportunity People might think that uh, well, forming a naked singularity would be bad because we wouldn't be able to predict, but we wouldn't be able to predict according to the classical theory of general relativity. This means that we should go beyond this theory in order to, to continue. And then a naked singularity in this sense could be an opportunity to learn about the regime of uh, strong quantum gravity. But if this conjecture, the weak uh, cosmic censorship conjecture is correct, then what it means is that uh, nature doesn't allow us to do it. That the nature, for some reason, prefers to hide Planck scale physics from us, or at least from us who are not suicidal. We don't want to jump into inside a black hole. So, well, what do we do with uh, this statement? Well, this is this was formulated as a conjecture, so it's something that can be true or false, and we know that it's false, that it can be violated with uh, cosmic censorship. But this is I mean, this can be violated, but then we well, have to look into the details of how it can be violated and what does it mean in terms of this uh, allowability to observe the regime of uh, quantum gravity. Well, the cases where uh, weak cosmic censorship, the violation is uh, well attested. I think that there are two of them, two main uh, paradigms for violations of, the, of this conjecture. One of them was discovered in 1993 by Mark Chopwick. It's the phenomenon of a critical collapse, where you start with a spherical symmetric configuration, say of some scalar field. You let it uh, collapse under its own uh, self gravity, and then you tune parameters so that uh, well, the scalar cloud is, say, weak, and it's going to collapse and bounce back. If it's very strong, it will collapse and form a black hole. You tune the parameters so that uh, well, what you form is an ever smaller black hole until you reach regime where the black hole that you would form would have technically zero mass, and that would be a naked singularity. Okay. So in that, uh, at that point, what you find is a region where you have that the curvature is diverging. The other example, the other uh, instance where we know that uh, cosmic censorship, with cosmic censorship is violated, is in the case of the instability, the evolution, non-linear evolution of the instability of a black string or a black thing. The phenomenon of uh, the instability was discovered at the linear level by Gregory Lapin the same year as Chopwick uh, did his uh, numerical experiments, but it was only almost 20 years later that a fully nonlinear evolution was uh, performed for the system, and this was done by Leonard Pretorius. It's uh, something that you can find in YouTube. It's, it's a video, I'm showing you snapshots of the video, where you have this string, it's a black string, it's a green object over there, which uh, initially is becoming these developing ripples, and these ripples uh, grow, and they continue growing until at a finite time, you reach regions where the curvature is becoming arbitrarily large. Because this is a numerical simulation, at some point the code crashes, but well, you see that it's really going into that direction of well, uh, then, uh, allowing the curvature to grow unbounded in some way. So we have these uh, violations of uh, cosmic censorship. These are similarities that we can observe uh, from a distance. So does this mean that nature is giving us a chance to do quantum gravity, uh, the safety of a lab? Okay. Does, this, uh, does nature uh, give us this opportunity to probe uh, physics at the Planck scale? Well, let's examine a little bit more these uh, violations. One property that uh, both of them have is that the violations involve very small regions where the curvature is becoming large. It's not like we're forming a large region where the curvature is, is diverging. This is a zero mass of the black hole and the region where the black string is pinching is also very small. So it's, uh, you, you can say that the mass, the, you began with something that had a big mass and then out of all of this mass, it's only a small fraction, a tiny fraction, it's the zero, 
mass fraction, if you want a Planck scale, uh, Planck mass uh, fraction of it, that uh, goes into forming a singularity. That's a bit like a, the LHC, where you collide trillions of particles, of particles, and one of them gives you the Higgs. It's uh, maybe even less efficient than the, than the LHC. But, uh, well, that's what you get. It's a very small violation of, uh, of cosmic censorship. It's a very tiny opportunity to observe uh, Planck scale physics. So maybe the weak cosmic censorship conjecture, which technically, as we saw, it's not valid, maybe it can still be improved in a way that would be uh, would be valid or at least consistent with the examples that we know of. But uh, where well, I mean, the original conjecture may have been wrong, but the spirit may be uh, retained. Because maybe if this singularity that we form is very small, maybe you can still retain predictability. Okay. So an improvement of the weak cosmic censorship conjecture would be to say that you can form naked singularities, but only very mild ones. These ones that are small in size and mass and probably in duration. Because what is this Planckian size black hole or Planckian size object that we form? What is it going to do? Well, in the case of the critical collapse, or in the case of the Laplace instability, we found something that looks like a tiny black hole or some object with a Planck, uh, Planck mass. It's something that it's neutral, it doesn't have any conserved charges. It's something that, in principle, does nothing preventing it from decay. And in quantum mechanics, you know that if something can decay or something can happen, it will happen. If this can decay, it will decay. So this Planck size object. What it's naturally going to do is well to decay by what well, emitting a few uh, quanta of uh, Planckian energy, and then it's going to disappear. And then you have just a few of these quanta flying apart, and it's a very, very tiny violation. You start with something that system that was classical, and you, you end up with just a handful of uh, Planck scale uh, quanta. Okay. Uh, Roberto, I have a question. Sure. Uh, from what I remember, Christodoulou, some time ago, in a class of context, proved some rather uh, uh, rigorous theorems and yes. characterized uh, uh, special data about uh, initial data that could lead, in fact, to naked uh, singularities. Now, uh, are you going to discuss about this? I don't know if this would uh, characterize also the type of singularities that would form, but are you going to discuss this? I'm not going to discuss this much, but uh, what you say is correct. Uh, in fact, uh, Christodoulou's work was kind of uh, in the same context of uh, what uh, Chopwick found. It wasn't exactly the same, but it was a similar context. And I think that the, at the end of the day, the physical interpretation of uh, what he was doing is very much in line with uh, what we're saying, with what uh, Chopwick was, what, what Chopwick found, that you could find initial data that uh, would develop uh, naked singularities of this very mild kind. It was okay. more technical and so on, but I think it, it was at the end of the day, as I say, it's uh, physically, it uh, has the same content as the uh, phenomenon of uh, critical collapse that uh, Job Tewik uh, discovered. Right, but the question is whether he characterized also the type of singularity that would form. Therefore, he, he, yeah, okay, yeah, the singularity, I'm not sure that he characterized it, uh, how precisely he characterized it. I don't think it was the same example as uh, in the case of Job Tewik. Uh, okay. Of course, he would this uh, characterize the approach to the singularity. The singularity itself is something that well, mathematicians don't like to you say. I mean, you can evolve up to some point, but not further. And I'm okay. not sure that uh, how, how precisely he characterized the, the singularity. I don't know. Okay, thank you. Do you have a yeah? Yeah, I was just uh, going to ask. Uh, yeah, isn't it also that you always need uh, somehow fine tuning for that? You need fine tuning. Uh, yes. So you need fine tuning, and this is uh, one reason that some people sometimes dismiss this as a valid violation of uh, cosmic censorship. I don't think that that's a, a good argument. Fine tuning, what it means is that this is something that you're not going to, going to observe spontaneously in the sky, or only very rarely. Fine tuning, uh, what uh, this means is that it's uh, detecting this is the job of an experimentalist, not of an observer, not of an, uh, an astronomer. People at the LHC do fine tuning for a living. Yeah, but, uh, the fine tuning that you have, yes, okay, but the fine tuning that you have to do here is not exponential fine tuning, it's power law, it's something that's moderate. So I think it's very physical. I mean, even if it's fine tuning, it's physical. It's simply that you have, have to hire experimentalists in order to do this, or you have to want well, to find uh, one event out of a 
billions of events uh, out there in the universe. So it's something that will happen rarely, that you have to, that uh, spontaneously will happen very rarely, that you have to contrive to, to do it, but it's physical, it's something that can happen. As I said, experimentalists, I mean, that's go to any lab here, they're doing fine tuning all the day. Yeah, but you don't produce the neutral star uh, at least. Uh, you don't produce a neutron star, but here we're, what we're saying is uh, doing essentially very much like a, a, what they do at CERN, colliding things and trying to form something, fine tuning, so that you form some event that's rare. And uh, well, that's where you get uh, the maximum concentration of energy and density that you can observe from a, from a distance. For me, this is like a gravitational scattering experiment. Instead of using magnets to guide uh, your particles, you're setting things up and then you're using gravity to do the collision. And then, yeah, like... Uh, yeah, yes. all particles are more charged than they are charged with your gravity. So if you do have gravity, you, you need essentially... Uh, yeah, it's gravity. I mean, so, I mean, you don't need uh, any fancy particles over there. I mean, you have some, I mean, we do it with scalar fields, I mean, but uh, it's much scalar fields, but it's a phenomenon that's uh, more generic than that. So it's, uh, theoretical. Of course, it's theoretical. I'm not thinking that, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not putting money out from my pocket to pay a team to do this, okay? And I'm, I'm not going to go to anyone to convince them. It's for some future civilization, yes. So, so cosmic censorship is very interesting. It's a statement about classical GR. It's a statement about uh, well, yeah, how far you can push classical GR, but then you can say that it's a statement. Sucks. Yes, exactly. But now you're talking about the duration of the negative thing. So this improvement seems to be like you have the singularity, GR is not over yes. and now you seem to be saying and making a statement about one. Yes, yes. So first, cosmic censorship is a statement about how uh, classical GR breaks down. And if you form a large uh, curvature singularity, then you think that you're in the regime of Planck scale physics, and then the classical theory doesn't tell you how to evolve. And we don't know how these things evolve. And that's something that we're trying to, to understand better. But then, well, I just made something that I think to me is uh, because we don't know. And when I say duration, that's speculation. Yeah. We don't know how it evolves just by definition because the classical theory doesn't allow you to evolve. The only is that if we form a neutral object that has a Planck scale uh, mass, this, as I say, it can decay, it will decay. But I don't have any anything stronger than this. Just uh, this sentence that I just said to. I mean, to me, it's reasonable. It's something that uh, is uh, like uh, what we expect uh, to happen near the endpoint of uh, Hopkins evaporation. Hopkins evaporation is something that it's not delivering classically. It's something that happens over a longer time scale. With cosmic censorship, the idea is that when you can violate it over short uh, time scales, time scales that are not large by. Uh, that remain finite as you send the H far to zero. Hopkins radiation. So it's something that, uh, yeah, you, it, the endpoint is similar to, I think, that the evolution of the endpoint of uh, Hopkins evaporation to form a tiny Planck size object that will just do some keep and disappear. Yeah. Yes. But uh, we are using uh, still uh, GR up to the. Exactly, yes, up to the point where it breaks down. It could also break before. Uh, well, if it could break uh, before, uh, then yeah, we'd like to see how. But uh, we don't find. I mean, we find that classical GR is valid up to the moment when we reach uh, Planck scale curvatures. I mean, we don't see any breakdown of the, of the theory. It might break before if there was some other uh, phenomena or some other physics that uh, somehow would not around before. It might be that, for instance, if you take uh, some classical quantum fields along with the evolution that this may have an, an impact on this that's something that maria likes to think about and uh, yeah it's something that uh, i think it's an interesting possibility that if you include semi-classical quantum effects and a large number of them that it could have an effect yeah that's something that we can discuss more but that's uh, something that for the time being i'm not assuming i'm assuming that all of these additional effects are, are small but uh, yeah and you have somebody who's thought a lot about this uh, yes. Just to just to be clear, so we start with a black string, and this instability that you're talking about is just under the linearized perturbation. So there's some sort of a random effect. 
and, and to begin with, we had a horizon on the black screen. Yes. So it's the picture that uh, this original horizon pinches off at several locations, and there's a string of these matrix similarities forming. Yeah, so it's, I mean, the full evolution hasn't been followed. So, I mean, it's linearized, then you follow non, the nonlinear evolution, the ripples begin to grow and grow, and then they seem to be pinching at the, uh, it's not clear what the structure of the singularity is. Okay, so we see that it's pinching exactly where it's pinching or whether it's pinching uniformly along some cubes and what's the kind of uh, structure of the singularity that uh, you form. That's, I, I don't think that we understand it yet. I think it's an important uh, question, but uh, the techniques that we have for this now, the best techniques are numerical techniques and pushing numeric and numerical relativity into this highly singular regime, that's very hard. It's very challenging, but it's a, it's a good point. Yeah. So, okay, so as you correctly said, I mean, we're talking about a classical GR taking us into a regime of uh, quantum gravity. So then, well, we would need a theory of quantum gravity to tell us what this means in this uh, bigger context. Of course, the quantum theory of gravity that we have is ADS CFT. And then, uh, well, what does ADS CFT tell us about all these questions that I've that I been uh, mentioning? And uh, more precisely, can we find a setup where we can address these questions in ADS, in ADS CFT that uh, makes sense and that it's uh, solvable? Well, this was the questions that uh, Maria and I we were asking ourselves uh, over a year ago. And then, uh, well, the setup that we found that it's uh, we thought uh, where we could make uh, progress is the uh, problem of studying the instability of these black strings, but now putting them in, in ADS. And that's what I'm going to discuss next. So black strings in uh, ADS, you can uh, find them in this, in this form. So you take, uh, I'm going to do, this is going to be global ABS, not Poincaré ABS. So that's why I'm drawing this as a disk. Then I take a particular slicing of uh, ABS and in each of these slices at this constant value of this uh, Z coordinate, I put a, a black hole, a Swazil ABS set unit. So the geometry is something like this. It's, a, it's not, a, not a constant radius, something that grows in the way that we used to in ABS. But it's a black string again. In terms of uh, what uh, you get at the boundary, so this string extends all the way to the conformal boundary of ABS. And the conformal boundary, you have that the string intersects the boundary up to two uh, places, two black holes, which are at antipodal points of the conformal boundary, the sphere of the conformal boundary of, of ABS. So that's what you have. You have your boundary has two black holes. It's a spherical universe with two black holes in it. And I'm going to be considering that uh, well, this geometry is fixed. So you know that in ABS CFT, I can fix my boundary geometry to be whatever I want. The boundary that I that the boundary geometry that I have is each one. Now, this configuration had already been considered uh, many years ago by some people, by Peter Yaman Khan, and they studied, well, are these black strings unstable or stable? And they did a linearized analysis of uh, perturbations similar to what Gregor uh, Lafranc had done. And they found that uh, these strings, when they are thin enough compared to the radius of ADS, these uh, black strings are unstable to developing these ripples, developing these lumps along their length. But their analysis was just a linearized analysis. And then what we want to see is uh, what, what, how does this linear instability evolve at a linear level. Okay. But before doing this, before doing the analysis of the nonlinear evolution and finding what's the endpoint, maybe it's a good idea to look for possible endpoints of the instability. Where can it end? What are the final configurations, static configurations that could be potentially endpoints of this nonlinear evolution? That's simpler because studying static configurations is simpler than studying dynamical evolution. And uh, analysis of uh, different uh, configurations that have the same asymptotics as uh, we've been discussing, that's two black holes at the antipodal points of uh, the boundary of ADS. These uh, configurations uh, of this kind uh, were constructed uh, numerically by Don Marov and George Santos. And they found, uh, well, 
many different classes of configurations, but the most important ones are the following. One of them is what we just described, this uniform black screen, which uh, sometimes it's also referred to as a black panel. But there are other configurations. You see that in this case, the two black holes at the boundary are joined through the interior by this uh, black screen. But you can also have configurations where the black holes at the boundary are separated. And these are known as uh, black droplets. But there are also configurations where the black holes at the boundary are uh, joined by something that's having some fat funnel, but a very fat one. You can think of this fat panel as a kind of a large black hole nadius, a large nadius black hole that's connected to the boundary through two tubes. But it's essentially like, like a large nadius black hole that's connected to the, to the boundary and ending at these two black holes. Can you have uh, the black droplet with a black hole in the middle? Yes, yes. That, those are uh, among other possibilities. You can have uh, actually an arbitrary number of them. Which one would you expect? The string is going to drop into the We're going to see what, uh, what happens. Okay. But uh, these are the basic ones. And the other ones, what well, I mean, we can have more black holes, as, as you're saying. And there are a few other more, which are a bit more complicated. But these are the, the, the ones that are going to play a more a prominent role in the, in the discussion. Now, once you have this, these configurations, you can analyze the thermodynamics and decide which one is thermodynamically preferred. And what uh, Marlon van Santos uh, found is that uh, what the configurations uh, that are preferred for different ranges of uh, parameters, one of them, uh, when you, as I said, you have the, this, uh, this configuration is unstable when it's thin enough, the, the black screen. Uh, you have this phase, and then you have the two other phases. The one that's uh, thermodynamically preferred is this one, the uh, fat panel, and this one is never dominant. Okay. You might think that if the black string is going to pinch and split into smaller black holes, like it does in that synthetic black case, you might think that the normal evolution should be this one. But now, well, now we see that at least thermodynamics tells us that this is never dominant thermodynamically. So if you have to make a guess on uh, what the nonlinear evolution of the instability of this object will be, you might think what well, it's going to go where thermodynamics prefers it to be, which would be this phase. But actually, the story is more complicated. Let's see whether this, uh, which, well, how these two evolutions could be possible. The first one, the evolution where this uh, black string becomes uh, fatter and fatter. This is something that's possible, can happen, uh, by essentially a phenomenon that we call the black tsunami flow. Here you have uh, black holes at the boundary, they are fixed. These black holes have a, a fixed, the geometry at the boundary is fixed, so they can act as uh, sources of heat or, of heat or sinks of, uh, of heat for your uh, dual conformal theory, so they can pump energy in or out indefinitely, because at the end of the day, what we're doing is keeping the temperature at the boundary fixed with not keeping the total energy fixed. So you can have horizon generators, you can have horizon generators flowing from the boundary to the bulk in an arbitrary number of And this phenomenon, where you have many horizon generators flowing from the boundary to the bulk, this is what we call the black tsunami. This would make this horizon development grow. Now, you may worry that uh, well, what happens to the area, in this case, is that the area grow or does grow. Well, actually, since we're, our boundary conditions is, are not uh, fixed energy boundary conditions, but uh, fixed temperature boundary conditions within the canonical ensemble, instead of uh, having an area theorem, what we have is a free energy theorem. What uh, these configurations have to do is uh, minimize the free energy. The free energy uh, can only decrease, uh, or it cannot increase on the dynamical classical evolution. So, this is a phenomenon that uh, can occur that uh, you have, as I say, horizon generators flowing from infinity into the bulk and making it grow. The other phenomenon uh, it's different, it's uh, more like a what, what we learned from the role of instability, and it's that the string would want to pinch. And that's something that we think should be possible. If the string is thin enough, then well, it's not going to sense 
this, if in this region it's anything, no? it's not going to sense that it's in ADS. It's going to feel, at least for some time, like it's in flat space. And then it will pinch, it will pinch more quickly than it realizes that it's in, in ADS. So then, if this is thin enough, it will have enough time to pinch for the negative singularity. And then, well, what, as I said, what we expect is that this negative singularity is going to evaporate, and then you will evolve into a configuration with separated objects. So this is like having this kind of evolution, but in a small region close to the center. So there are these two possible evolutions uh, for this system. Yes. And what is it that uh, we have found? Because we, I'm going to tell you later how we've uh, done the nonlinear evolution of the instability, but I'm going to tell you first the results of uh, what we obtained. So we have the black thing that uh, where there are these two effects that you can have horizons, horizon generators flowing from the boundary into the bulk, and you also have this other phenomenon that the string wants to pitch. So one possible evolution that we found is what we call the direction. That this flow of uh, generators is fast enough that uh, it just occurs and it grows a large uh, bulge of, the, of this uh, horizon in the bulk. But if you take different initial configurations, different initial black strings or different initial ways of predicting the black string, what we find is that, uh, well, this is thin enough and you keep it in the right way, this is going to form a pitch. And then we will get a violation of a cosmic censorship. But then what happens after you form the singularity, after you form the negative singularity? Well, we found two different uh, possible evolutions. One of them is that uh, well, this pinch just uh, severes apart the horizon. So you end up in a configuration where you have two separate uh, droplets. And as we said, this is uh, not thermodynamically dominant, but it still it can be metastable. It's a configuration in the evolution. It gets trapped not in the configuration of a minimum free energy. It's just a local minimum free, free energy, but just get that gets uh, stuck there. But then there's another possible evolution, which is uh, that after you form this, after the string pinches, well, the tsunami comes, the tsunami comes, and then it uh, well, just uh, washes out the singularity and covers it again. It's kind of a delayed censorship. The sensor arrived uh, too late, but uh, what well, finally arrives and washes out the singularity. This is more like a tsunami. This is not so much a tsunami. Do you know that the, when a tsunami comes, you're in the beach, and then you see the water receding away from you, the seafloor gets exposed like this, and then the tsunami comes and washes everything out. Okay? So this is properly a tsunami. This is uh, what well, you don't get the full tsunami phenomenon. Now, this is uh, the, what we found in, in evolutions that I will tell you later how we've uh, done them. But then it's also interesting to consider what's the dual point of view from the point of view of the of uh, ADS-CFT, the CFT. So, yes. So, if you start from this metastable endpoint, one yes. start point, what happens? So, this is uh, dynamically stable, but it's metastable. With, uh, what this means is that if you kick it hard enough, maybe you can trigger a tsunami. You mean it's static if you, you put it's, sufficiently strong pressure? Yes. So it's at a local minimum. If you introduce a large uh, enough uh, perturbation, then uh, what, you can trigger a tsunami that's going over the, the barrier and then what, evolving into a configuration like this. And the joining would be smooth? Uh, yeah, that's, I mean, it's, there's no singularity in the, in the joining. <laughs> It's just like a measure of two horizons. That's a measure of black holes. And maybe I didn't catch it, but what, what controls which way you go? Is it the size of the black hole on the boundary? So it's, uh, it's complicated. Yeah. It's uh, in part the size of the black hole on the boundary, which also is telling you how thin, uh, thin, or thin, uh, thin or fat the initial configuration is, but also the way that you pick it, the initial perturbations. Ah, so 
So you can have uh, initial perturbations, depending on your initial perturbations. For instance, you can go here, and then it's essentially the initial perturbation that tells you whether you're going to go to one or the other. And there are more complex evolutions. So there are in some evolutions, we also find that there's some uh, block in the middle form. Some block in the middle form. So there's no one primary okay. Okay. No, no, it's not just a, it's not as simple as that. Uh -huh. It's a, a, it, actually it's a very rich, uh, very rich uh, dynamical setup. Yeah, you can have, uh, and so what kind of linear and linear perturbations are you talking about? So, senders and things you can put. so depending on uh, what if your initial perturbation is leading something to pinch, then it will want to pinch. If your initial perturbation is growing a uh, blob in the middle, that's what may tend to, to grow, but it may also depend on what you put uh, away from the middle. Okay. So, thank you. I mean, we don't have a full picture because we saw that it's complicated because you can introduce perturbations of different kinds. Then uh, there's several modes that can be unstable here and they may compete. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's complicated. So the dual point of view is the following. So now we're going to the boundary view. So the initial view is that we have two black holes at the boundary and then we perturb them a little bit and then they will begin to emit uh, Hawking radiation of the CFT. This configuration where so we go over the here is classical physics in the, in the background of the, of the cross. Yes, so the, the boundary uh, physics that we have is we have a fixed geometry of a universe, spherical universe, with two black holes at the antipodal points of, the, of this spherical universe. This geometry is fixed, and then we're solving quantum field theory, CFT, in, uh, in this background. And as you know, when we have quantum field theory in the presence of black holes, then well, the, these uh, quantum fields can be Hawking radiated. And Hawking radiation of the CFT, of course, it's something that corresponds, it's thermal, it corresponds to some horizons moving some, uh, somehow in the bulk. So for instance, this phenomenon over here, or we go from here to here, what this means is that the universe is getting flooded with thermal radiation. So you're having uh, thermal radiation issuing from the black holes that you have over here, and they are filling more and more of the, of the boundary, because what you have is a large black hole in the, in the bulk. A large black hole in the bulk, that corresponds to a thermal state in your boundary theory. And this is what, uh, what you have, the two black holes that you have at the boundary, they are beginning to radiate uh, into the rest of the universe until the universe is filled with thermal radiation in equilibrium with the black holes. But these other evolutions are uh, more exotic because what you find is that for some reason, this uh, state, before you have any flooding of radiation, anything, well, at some point in evolution, there's some radiation burst that issues from here. So you're forming some small similarity, something that's going to emit some radiation to the boundary, and you're going to have some burst of radiation that's going to be short, it's a transient, and as we will say later, it's, uh, it will also be mild. After this happens, then the subsequent evolution is going to be that you end up either on this black holes with some halos of CFT around them. In this case, the universe is not entirely filled with radiation. The radiation is confined to a halo around the, the black holes of the boundary. Or, well, if the evolution is this delayed censorship, then in this case, yes, what you have is that well, eventually the universe will be flooded with, with thermal radiation. As I say, there are other possibilities that, uh, that we found, but these are the main ones. So, this is the result of our study. How did we get uh, all of these uh, conclusions? How did we get here? Well, in principle, what you should do to do uh, in order to solve this is what did do like uh, Leonard and Pretorius did. You write up some code to do the nonlinear evolution of a uh, black stream, but now you do it in, in a deficit space. So for this, you have to know as much uh, numerical relativity as Leonard and Pretorius uh, do, which is not my case. You also have to uh, have a supercomputer running for uh, weeks. Uh, to get the simulations, and I don't have the patience to do that. So we took a shortcut to get at least the qualitative uh, evolution in a much more efficient way. 
What we did is to use an effective theory of uh, black hole dynamics in the limit of a large number of dimensions, which is something that we have been developing over uh, the last years uh, in Barcelona and other works. This large the effective theories, I'm not going to give you many details of them because this is not a talk about the large D. Here, large D, we're using it as a tool to essentially to obtain effectively in a very efficient way the dynamics of nonlinear dynamics of uh, horizons. Because uh, these effective theories that uh, we found, they isolate uh, very efficiently the, what happens, the evolution of the dynamics of the, of the horizon, how they grow, how they shrink, and everything. And this large D limit, one of the reasons that uh, it simplifies, it's one of them, it's not the, the only thing, is that uh, all the problems with uh, gravitational radiation that's being emitted by the system, these are absent. Gravitational radiation is decoupled in this large scale limit at all orders in terms of this. So you're just focusing on what happens on the horizon. What happens uh, at larger distances, that's something that we don't see. Now, as a warm up to what we do in these large D effective theories. Let me show to you how we solve first the problem of what, what Lennon and Pretorius did, the black screen instability in the center of large space, but now at large. Mm -hmm. The evolutions are, if you have a black screen at uh, some moderate uh, value of D, like, and this is just kind of a, the same uh, sort of thing that uh, Lennon and Pretorius did, it's a slightly different technique. This is like, we've seen before. The last the effective theory gives you this. So it looks very much the same as uh, when what happens at a moderate uh, D. So it seems to capture the same dynamics, at least uh, qualitatively. Maybe you're worried that these uh, don't look like spheres, that these look a bit more like uh, Gaussian, Gaussian blobs. The reason that they look like uh, Gaussian blobs is just uh, an effect of a uh, large D geometry. It doesn't have to do with general relativity. With so there are infinitely so the, the spheres I'm writing them like this. So you have I'm having a direction along the direction of the string, this theta, and you have this factor, and here you have a large, large sphere. What happens when you draw, when you write a sphere like this, this vibration, where you're putting spheres along a segment, and then this sphere becomes small here, it becomes small here, it becomes large here. When D is very large, most of the area is concentrated close to the region, close to the area, exponentially large. Okay, so this is because this when D is large, this becomes like a Gaussian. Okay. So this is why these look like Gaussian when they are, I mean, depending on how you present them, they are still spheres. Simply that the area is localized, and this is what I'm plotting here. Simply the area, the area is localized close to the center of the, of the sphere. Or the equator. Yes. It's large and fine. Eventually, so we're, uh, yeah, so, uh, well, here, this is, uh, we're, we're taking actually the, the limit of infinity. I mean, we find a well-defined by scaling uh, variables and uh, coordinates uh, appropriately, we can take a limit of large D and obtain finite results. And then we can add corrections to that. So it's, so it's strictly D infinite that we're doing. Well, the picture is just uh, two. So this this picture, I mean, it's uh, when you have to rescale the, this coordinate by uh, square root of d, so this is finite. Okay. So you rescale your coordinate so that you're focusing actually on this region okay. where you're capturing the area. So, <clears throat> well, that's what we did in the case of asymptotic flat uh, strings. Now we can do we can obtain the effective equations for asymptotically ABS black strings. We obtain the effective equations simple we found a linear instability and then we can do again what this nonlinear evolution is. and this nonlinear evolution is something that you can very easily do uh, in your laptop uh, computer in a matter of a fraction of a second or a few seconds so this these different scenarios the way that we observe them in our numerical evolutions were like this so this one where we have the uniform black string uh, growing at the center uh, into a very large uh, horizon. This is what it looks like. So what you saw is two-dimensional PDs. Yeah, it's two-dimensional PDs. Uh, actually, the problem is two plus one dimensional, but in, at the large delimit, one of the, the directions, the direction, the radial direction, it's uh, 
integrated using uh, well, the large D uh, approximations. So it's a one plus one uh, evolution that we're doing. So, see that it's growing, actually grows extremely large, and that corresponds to this evolution into a bad one. The other two, we take the black string, it's a thinner one, and we kick it in a particular way, see that it's pinching and then receding, and then stabilizing in a computation like this. And the last one, form the pinch, but then the tsunami comes and washes it out. Okay. And these uh, evolutions, these are things I could do them right now in front of you. It's something that's very easy to play with. Two questions. Um, one, how do you know that your thing cuts survives in the run number of dimensions? Okay, so for this, what we have to use, because this, you never, in the last day theory, you never uh, really get to the similarity. Yeah. You get is something that seems to be shrinking and shrinking until you get to uh, something that's exponentially small. Yeah. At that moment, the evolution crashes, so you don't, you don't really know. So what we, what here, what we have to invoke is that we know from Len and Pretorius and people who have reproduced that, mm -hmm. we know that in those cases, at finitely, these things pinch off to something that's what diverging curvature. So then you, you stop your simulation here and restart it. In principle, you should, yeah, yeah, you can, uh, yeah. Here, we stop it here, and then we say, well, this, the only plausible evolution that we can think of is that uh, this is then going to uh, what, pinch up and uh, what evaporate the singularity and evolve into a droplet. That part is conjecture. Yeah, sorry, so let me just ask that, yeah. So, you, your simulations are done at large D. Yes. How do you know at small D, you only don't get, maybe you only get the direct tsunami. Maybe you never get the pinch off tsunami. No, the pinch off, we can argue that it will happen mm -hmm. at finite D, because I know that if a string is thin enough, if it's much thinner than the ADF radius, yes. then it's going to look very much like, uh, like in flat space. And then the time scale, I can make it, uh, I can control it parametrically to be smaller than the ADF radius. And the tsunami comes on an ADS time scale because that's something that's traveling from the boundary to the valley. So that's going to happen on an ADS time scale. Whereas this pinching is controlled by the thickness. And I can make this as smaller as the ADS radius as I want. So this, we see then that we have this, all of this phenomena that we can form the naked singularities in ADS, that we have all of this, well, this new phenomenon of the tsunami that wasn't known before. And uh, well, now what we would like to do is, uh, well, can we say something about the CFT, CFT signal at the boundary of uh, this formation of the naked singularity? So this is kind of a second part. It was a second part of our paper. It's also going to be a second part of our talk. Because the techniques that we're going to use in order to study this are going to be different. Because even if the large D technology was very useful to follow the evolution, the dynamics of the horizon, it's not good for extracting the signal at the boundary. And that good part is because of this thing that I said, that the gravitational radiation is decoupled perturbative. At all perturbative orders, you never see gravitational radiation coming from this region to, to the boundary. So an effect is non-perturbative. You have to work harder in order to, to It's possible, but I say it's much harder. So since uh, this wasn't uh, easy, <coughs> we decided that uh, we would try a different strategy, something that wouldn't require a uh, large expansion, something that, uh, in principle, can be applied in any field. We use a linearized model for the formation of the singularity. Yes. Um, the decoupling of the linearizing dynamics of the large field, do you have an or is the difficulty to think about the so, I mean, that's something that's generic for uh, large D, uh, these large D effective theories, that uh, what you're doing is essentially concentrating all of the dynamics in that region very close to the horizon. And then the uh, way that this is coupled to the exterior region, whether it's ADS as internal band or whatever, that coupling is non-perturbative. We understand why it's non-perturbative. It's essentially that, uh, well, that uh, the follows that you get farther from where you are, are, are to the D of the minus D, which is the same, which is not perturbative in one way. But that, uh, this region, this follows, you 
you will never see in this approach. But this is not so we tried a different study and we abandoned for, for this uh, the largely methods, even if I think that with some effort something can be done. But uh, we tried something that had already been proposed and uh, investigated by Paul Chesler and Benson Way, not in the context of the black instability, but they applied it to uh, critical collapse. They wanted to study critical collapse in, in ABS, the other example of an, a violation of the cosmic sensors that we saw. They did it, they did it numerically, and they also had an analytical uh, linear model. The idea here for this uh, model that we're going to use is that uh, both critical collapse and the black string things, they exhibit some sort of uh, self-similarity as you're approaching the region and the moment when the similarity comes. Self-similarity here means that if you have, uh, say, two variables, what you have, the time variable and the space variable, that a self-similar function is one that, uh, what, when you uh, multiply t and x by some uh, factor, well, the function remains the same. It could also acquire some refactor over here, depending on what's the uh, dimension of the, of the function. But uh, for simplicity, we just consider that this is a uh, weight zero function. Self-similarity, so there's two kinds of uh, self-similar behaviors that can appear and that do appear in this uh, context. One of them is continuous self-similarity, and the other one is discrete self-similarity. It is that uh, what continuous self-similarity is that the function, as you go approach t equals zero and x equals zero, this is what well, shrinking in a way that's uh, self-similar and at all times something that happens continuously. Whereas discrete self-similarity is something that happens what well, every uh, it's not at all times that you have that the function repeats itself. It's that it repeats itself only after some uh, discrete intervals. And these discrete intervals are getting uh, more narrowly spaced as you approach the singular point. Okay. So this is uh, this self similarity. It's a property that uh, it's known. Uh, to happen in the case of a critical collapse, job to uh, found it. Uh, there's also evidence that uh, the black string pinches also exhibit some sort of uh, self similarity. Can be discrete or continuous. It's not very clear because we don't understand, uh, understand the structure of singularity in the singularity yet. But we're going to assume, just because it's something that seems to be a property, there's some circumstantial evidence of it, and it's also, well, idea that's uh, going to allow us to, to push ahead. We're going to assume that uh, naked singular formation here occurs through some self-similar shrinking of some region in our space. So like this, some strings, and this is shrinking. That's a similar one. We're also going to assume, because you may say, well, that there's some strings, or part of the black string also, uh, on the sides of the region that are uh, shrinking. I'm going to assume just because it's going to make my life easier, that this such similar region where the curvature is divergent is a specific divergent, that this is essentially independent of the surroundings which are the smaller. That I can basically ignore what's happening around it. It's an assumption that we have to make. I cannot give you better than justifications. If you don't like it, well, sorry, but this is what I can offer you for, for now. And then another uh, assumption that we're going to make is that this self-similar region, but you have strong nonlinear effects. What we're also going to assume is that, well, maybe there's some region where this is uh, nonlinear effects are, are, are large, but away from this region where there's a similarity and strong nonlinear effects, we're going to assume that there's also, that this self-similar region also extends into a region where gravity is, uh, what we can apply still uh, some appro uh, approximately at least an inner approximation. This may sound like an assumption that's not at all uh, granted, that uh, well, maybe doesn't hold. But well, one thing that you can do, and this is something that uh, Paul Chesler and Benson Way did, is that uh, when they applied this model to their uh, analysis of a critical collapse, which they did fully non-linearly in numerical relativity, the results of the linear approximation match very well with the results of the full nonlinear evolution. 
So that's, that was a kind of a post facto check that the approximation, that this uh, linearization, that uh, that was something that was somehow, for some reason, that we don't fully understand it was capturing the some at least some aspects of this formation of the line. So what we're going to do is take ADS and study a problem of linear gravity. That's like considering gravitational waves that are uh, collapsing in ADS. And we're going to take a superposition of these gravitational waves that has shows such similar behavior near the origin at some instant. That's the model. And then once we have this, we construct a solution, this superposition of gravitational waves that are collapsing, giving us such similar behavior near the origin. Then since we have the solution and we have it explicitly, because this is linear gravity, then we can extract what is the field at infinity. And what we're going to extract is what well, the one point function of the stress and tensor, the expectation value of the stress and tensor near infinity. We can also extract other information since we have a full solution. But the simplest thing is just to extract the, this one point function. So the minus singularity forms in the middle, but for very short time. It uh, forms, I mean, we form it and then we stop. I mean, we, we don't continue. I mean, ah, we, so you stop at equal we, we stop uh, at equal C. Well, actually, since we're in linear, it's, the, it's a linear solution, we don't stop, but uh, we're not allowed the principle. We, we, we don't trust it. So the results of doing this, I'm not showing you the calculations, a calculation in linear gravity, it's kind of a little complicated because you have to work on a particular basis and you have to do some transformations, but uh, yeah, it was possible to do it. I can tell you more about the details of uh, this calculation. It's kind of fun. Uh, I mean, well, anyone can enjoy working with this. Jacobi polynomial. But the result is that uh, so we did this, we construct the similar region, then this moment when the similarity forms, it takes some time to propagate to the boundary. And then what we find is that the stress tensor that you measure near infinity it has a field behavior, the holographic stress tensor, the energy density, it vanishes linearly in time. Pi over two is the time that it takes to propagate to the boundary. Pressure also vanishes. The shear, nevertheless, diverges. Diverges like one over t minus pi over t. So that's the result of the calculation. So what does this mean? Well, first of all, we have to bear in mind that the boundary signal is not smooth because even if this is this is the result of kind of the envelope of the signal, the signal is oscillating uh, a lot because we're assuming discrete set similarity. So it oscillates an infinite number of times before you get to the point where you find the signal. So you have a signal that involves arbitrarily high frequencies, but the energy density, this component over here, the energy density is vanishing as you approach this point. So this your looks like it's uh, yes. Your unit are yes to get yes, yeah. ADS Yeah, this is linear gravity, this is the time that it takes. So this, uh, this is what we find. Shear is diverging, the energy density vanishes. If we were doing this in a CFT, and uh, what we have the cutoff at the Planck scale, which means that we would have a, a large end, but a finite end, then what we expect, since the energy density is becoming uh, arbitrarily small, what we expect is that we're going to have a number of quanta that's going to be small compared to n squared we expect order one quantum, which is a bit like I was saying before, right? You form the similarity, the small singularity is going to emit just a few quanta. Each of these quantum is going to have Planck energy, which means that the energy of each of these quanta is going to be something that uh, is of order n squared, large n limit, or we have very large n the Planck energy in classical chemical limits. And but then we have a large shears, and these shears are, are localized. Are localized because it's just a few quanta that are going to the boundary. So it's it's a bit like uh, what happens if you're uh, you're having some source of uh, gamma rays, so a small source of gamma rays. So some object that emits a few gamma rays, some radiating uh, some atom that's emitting a few decaying by emitting a few uh, gamma rays. Uh, a gamma ray can have very large energy, uh, each one of them, but the total energy is small. It's just one gamma ray, one photon, one 
say it was one plankian gamma ray. This uh, gamma ray, it creates large vibrations in your atoms. That's the analog of creating large shears. And the dipole and the gamma ray is going to make your atom vibrate a lot. So your gamma gravitons here are also going to make whatever they hit, they are going to make it shear very rapidly. But it's just a tiny effect that affects I mean, this is hitting you. It's like, uh, well, now you have some gamma ray hitting your body. I'm sure that some gamma rays are hitting your bodies right now. And uh, I bet that you don't notice that. So it's simply that some gamma rays, a few gamma rays are hitting your body. They are making some atom in your body vibrate uh, very quickly, but that's not deadly. It's any of you falling dead because you are getting some gamma rays from your surroundings. So I think that this is the same thing that happens in the formation of this blur. You have some gamma gravitons that are going to the boundary. It's just a few of them, or the one of them. They are making, they are creating large shears locally, but uh, that's something that, uh, well, it's a very tiny disruption in the evolution of your system. From the point of view of the CFT, it's just a few quanta. And your CFT is a theory that has a large number of degrees of freedom. Yes? How do we interpret the moment? Yeah, the momentum, I think it's, uh, yeah, the momentum remains constant. Uh, in principle, it's, uh, it's isotropic. But uh, yeah, I don't have a good interpretation for this. At the moment. If it's constant, I'm not worrying too much about it. But yeah, I think maybe we should think a bit more about it. That's a good question. I don't have a good answer. So then what have we learned? I'm coming to the, to the end of the talk. Sorry if I exceeded my, my time. Let's just start it a little bit. So, well, first, we've seen that uh, cosmic censorship can be violated uh, in ABS by the evolution of these uh, black stains. There are other systems that can also violate cosmic censorship in, in ABS, but this is just a simple setup. And uh, the way that it does is by well, some uh, dynamic evolution that's uh, interesting because it has this combination of uh, pinch offs, uh, tsunamis, the tsunamis that want to uh, hide the singularity but they arrive too late. And that's uh, something that I think is interesting for another reason. Among them, that uh, we have this uh, dual shift interpretations in terms of Hawking radiation coming from black holes. So that uh, we're describing Hawking radiation in terms of some classical bulk uh, phenomenon. And then, well, we have Hawking radiation, but we also have these mild bursts of gamma gravitons hitting the, the boundary. Mild, it's a, there's something similar, there's some signal at the boundary, but it's a mild signal. So this seems to go well in line with this idea that the violations that we can observe, violations of cosmic sensors that we can observe, they are mild. They are not uh, very big uh, disruptions, and maybe they can be fixed with, uh, well, the CFT. This would be finite and effects. They have to be finite. It's not something that uh, you wouldn't see in perturbation theory in one over n. This has to be finite then. But the effects, even if they are finite and effects, the effects that may resolve the similarities, they may be still small. So they are the small, finite and effects. But we don't know what these are. We don't have a good model for the resolution of how the CFT resolves this singularity in finite term. Maybe some matrix model or some other model can do this. But uh, right now, well, we don't have that. We know that what we expect that the CFT should be able to tell us how to resolve these uh, singularities and how to go further, but we don't know yet how to do that. And then this, uh, there is this other phenomenon that I described of Hawking radiation on the boundary emitted from some black holes at the boundary. That's something that uh, we've seen that uh, we can do here. But in this talk, the boundary geometry, the black hole boundary, were fixed. There was no gravitational back reaction. These black holes were like in the original Hawking calculation, or what you do when you uh, we define when you go to Biddle and Davis, that you have quantum field theory in a fixed space time. This fixed space time, this fixed black hole can be radiating more well, by using arbitrary amounts. That's what the black tsunami does. But we would like to be able to well, uh, do 
consider a more realistic situation where, as you emit radiation, the black hole is also shrinking. Right? reaction from this. And this is something that uh, we can do also in this model. We can modify our model to include the radiation back reaction from the Hawking radiation. And then in this way, we're able to see black hole evaporation as a classical bulk evolution. That's something that we're working on. Uh, and then, uh, well, I hope that I can report, or maybe Maria will report here to you on what we do here in the say, near future. That's what we do. And with this, I'll stop here on a brighter note. Showing you the original identify <coughs> Fukushima. And thank you. Uh, I'm not sure I understood what happened on the boundary for the verbs because I understand that you say from inside that you have this negative energy that yes. is a single concept of another energy that yes. the boundary yes. is for this relation. If I just add the boundary, what do I see? Like well, on the boundary, you, you see some burst. I mean, we're taking something, a uh, model that's since the spherics limit, so it's homogeneous. Well, I mean, homogeneity is broken because the signal is uh, quadrupolar. But uh, I mean, at the boundary, what you see is some sudden burst appearing all over the universe. But it's coming from. It's not coming from the black holes. And so you're in a spherical universe. Yeah. You have two black holes at the. Uh, at the uh, antipodal points, and they are in a funny state where they begin to emit radiation. But as they are emitting radiation, at some point, there's a sudden flare in the universe. It's a mild flare, but it's not coming from, uh, from the black holes at the boundary. It's coming from everywhere. It's a property of the. Yeah, but that, that, this is what is not clear to me. What is the physics of the, of the boundary physics? Like, I should be able to think of some. Uh, uh, some... Source yes, yeah, that's a good question, and I don't think that we have a good answer. This is a phenomenon that's uh, very peculiar from the point of view of the CFT, but the bulk is telling you that that's uh, what you get. But how I mean, it's something that refers to properties of the state, the entire state of the CFT. It's not only had it, that does not only have to do with, with, uh, with this, is not Hawking radiation, this burst. It's a completely different phenomenon that refers to a particular state. Of the CFD in this in this universe, but, but the initial perturbation that it took, which is like uh, pinching the the the, the yeah. correspond to some initial condition. That it boundary. corresponds to some initial conditions on the entire bound on the entire boundary, and that's uh, yeah, it's going to correspond to modifying the state the of your uh, quantum the, fields. Uh, the uh, initial yeah. conditioning. Yes. 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 Of, uh, whatever they are called. Can you start with a state of the CFT that's unstable, then you're perturbing your quantum fields by putting a bit more energy density in some regions than, than in others. And then this state is developing, uh, well, it's becoming unstable, it's evolving in such a way that at some point, it's something that happens in a very, something that from the point of view of the boundary, it's not, it's, it's not local, it's something that's happening everywhere. It's not a, Propagating from one point of the of the boundary to another, the Hawking radiation does this. The Hawking radiation is coming essentially from the from the black holes and filling the universe. But this other uh, burst, uh, that's something that's uh, that happens everywhere in the, at, at your boundary. It's it's very mysterious. I agree with that. I mean, it's something that it's one of these things that uh, holography tells you that. Uh, that the CFT should have at a large and, and, uh, and strong coupling, because I don't think that you can see this in the weekly couple of the field theory. I think it's a strong but coupling. But you have also some gravitational uh, evolution, right? You allow uh, uh, the, uh, the gravitational, the classical gravitational field to go on the right side, just to stand out. No, it's a standard ADS. Well, I mean, standard ADS CFT. It's ADS CFT with boundary conditions, with specific boundary conditions. It's not, I mean, the boundary conditions are not just that your boundary is just the usual sphere. It's a sphere with uh, two black holes in it. How you could, uh, whether you could find uh, some, well, I think that you can also. We're not allowing a back reaction of, of, the, of the gravitation of the, of the CFT at the boundary. I mean, that's something that we've done later, but in the, this talk, the geometry of the boundary is fixed. 
the time. Okay, so they were by shrinking. So you consider working radiation, but without having the shrinking, it was the energy of the black hole was, uh, was not conserved. It's not conserved, yeah. I mean, the black holes are radiant because we're keeping the temperature of the system fixed, and these black holes had act as infinite uh, sources or uh, or sinks of, of energy. The so energy is not conserved. Hmm? So they are backreacted. Basically. No, the black holes are not uh, backreacted. The black holes are the black hole geometry is fixed. Just think, Bill and Davis, I'll give you uh, a configuration where I have a fixed black hole geometry. And then I put it in a state, I, I don't know, you can put it in the UNRU state, the black hole, and this black hole in the UNRU state is going to be radiating for eternity. Because it's not back reacting. That's the same situation as we have here. It's not radiating the, for eternity because it's in a finite volume. And at some point, you fill the universe with the radiation, but the black hole doesn't change. The geometry doesn't change. That's something that we do later, and that this is what we're doing, but uh, not what uh, I talked about introducing the back reaction, how the black hole is shrinking as it's emitting radiation. In that case, you're changing boundary conditions. You're not in the ensemble at a fixed uh, temperature. In that case, uh, you're working at fixed energy, you're including back reaction. But in this talk, I was working with fixed background, fixed temperature, energy not conserved. How about what you're doing now? So your, your final point. I want to understand how, if you can tell me, I want to understand how you're allowing gravity to appear on the boundary. Okay. Because, I mean, of course, you can fix it by hand and have evolution. Yes. Or you can impose, say, alternative boundary yes. condition. Yes. But then they don't really give you Einstein and gravity, right? Yes. Yes. So... yes, exactly. So, so, how do we do this? I mean, the way that we, and this, so in order to make your boundary dynamical, to couple the CFT to gravity, there's uh, two different ways, two main different ways of doing them, and there's combinations of them. One of them is what uh, Compare and Marl uh, called uh, setting the boundary free, which is changing the boundary conditions. And yeah. infinity. The other uh, way to do it is by bringing your boundary at finite distance inside. That's uh, the brain world holography model, because in this case, by having the boundary at finite distance, then the non-normalizable mode of the graviton becomes normalizable and then it's dynamic. That's uh, what you may call the uh, brain wall photography. Yeah. And that's what we're doing. And surely those are two black holes that can So then you can have, well, I mean, that depends on, uh, well, the evolutions that we're doing, that we're making, there's different things that you can do. You can use one brain, two brains, yeah. doing two brains, because it's simpler for symmetry. We're also keeping the symmetry, so they are not moving. Uh, closer, so they are. I mean, even if they might want to do it, we're imposing a symmetry that they remain there. What we have is that uh, well, we have the black holes on brains, and then the black holes can slide off the brain. And as your black hole slides off the brain, then its size on the brain is uh, shrinking, yes. and then you get more horizon in the bulk, which means that you have radiation from the black hole in the bulk, and that's uh, that's what we're seeing. In, Simulations. We're getting we're getting these black holes to evaporate. Into the we can also have collapse. We can begin with a configuration where we have a brain and then we have a black hole in the bulk. We throw the black hole in the bulk to the boundary, and then what this makes is when it hits the boundary, you get a black hole at the boundary, which means that your radiation has collapsed and produced a black hole. And that's we have both things, and uh, we're examining what we're playing with the numerical evolutions to to get a bigger picture. Not, not easy. I mean, what we get is what you can get in these models that sometimes are called the double holography, and you can study things. People have used these models to study uh, the page curve, to obtain the page curve of uh, radiation, because you can study the properties of the radiation, the CFT, now are mapped to classical properties of the, of the bulk. So I think that this is what you can get. How you can get uh, beyond this? I mean, not it's not easy. Yeah, certainly, that's something that we're not doing now. But you're trying to back from the boundary We can we can try to compute, and that's something that we have in mind doing, uh, keeping track of uh, what uh, things like page curves and the, how the radiation of the how the entropy of the radiation, the entropy of the black hole evolve. As, as that's something that we can. 
so that we can do it's going to take a bit more work to, to work out but probably everything is very explicit in, in what we're doing here and the only thing that we're doing numerically is the nonlinear evolutions but it's very easy from from there but it's doable from there extract and compute quantities explicitly like entropies how the entropy evolves how the free energy evolves or mass temperature how that's something that we can do explicitly from the online audience, please. Well, if not, then let's uh, thank Roberto again for having